RCSD at Chiang Mai University, the Mekong Land Research Forum. Um, this will kind of follow up from the, the words I gave on the regionalization of land on, when was that, on Wednesday. So what I'd like to do, I, I will start there and then from the example of that regionalization, kind of look quickly at some of the, some of the terminology, some of the, the, the fashion that is going around with land at the moment. And then rather than staying with the big picture, I'd like to present you with uh, some actual cases, some stories coming out of the region, which we will then come back to at the end. And from, from setting the scene like this, then I will introduce what's happening with this project, what we're trying, what we're trying to do with land. And then by going back to the cases, um, I'm going to attempt to make linkages with what we're doing with the notions of transdisciplinary uh, research and study. To, so hopefully we can kind of make some parallels and s see how, I've been, I've been using this talk to kind of think myself, how, does this connect what I'm doing? Could I think about this? Could I approach this in a transdisciplinary way? And we'll, we'll, well, we can see how successful that is. So let's start kind of where I left off on Wednesday, which is, I, I gave you these um, different maps uh, that, as I said at the time, had been produced by Jean-Christophe Dipa. And what we can see here is these re regional flows of investment that are going between different countries that seem to be leave, leaving countries such as Thailand, China and Vietnam and going into countries such as Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia. Now, out of this, it's very, in a one way, it's very easy to connect this to two of the sort of fashion terms which have come up around land in the last, let's say, five to eight years, um, which, are, which I'm sure you've probably come across both. One is land grabbing, and the other is the global land rush. Land grabbing, on one level makes, I mean, we, as the kind of examples we've come across through the different presentations, um, it kind of makes sense here in one way, in that as we have these land investments, and a lot of them are getting into, placed into the provision of land concessions by states to these foreign investors, often this is resulting in the expropriation of land from, say, smallholders, from, uh, um, say, ethnic minorities who are practicing um, custom customary la land tenure practices. So you could say in one sense, yes, it's very easy to see how land is being taken away from local users and given for these big investments. The one slight problem I would, I would give here is that land grabbing is often associated with the fact that grabbing is illegal. And this is where kind of the waters get a bit more murky in that, and this is actually part of the problem, in that often legal frameworks, either legal frameworks are very loose or being, you could say, being stretched to the, stretched or being geared towards the ex expropriation of land. So for example, if you take Myanmar, um, brought in two laws in what, 2011, I think. There were, one was the farmyard law, and um, the other was the vacant fallows and virgin land management law. And these were very much geared towards capitalizing land, to acquiring land. And a big consequence of these laws was that many people who did not have and did not have the means to get a land use certificate, the land which they were using and was theirs in their eyes, was then being classed as fallow or vacant or west, wasteland by the government and therefore up for grabbing. So often these kind of processes of land grabbing may be taking place within emerging land legal systems 
or kind of a, a usage as they presently stand. So without wanting to kind of backtrack from the severity of some of these situations, I just we have to maybe be a bit more critical when we think of using land, the term land grabbing. What do we mean? Land grabbing from who, for who, for what, within what context, what legality? So it's so it's it for me it's a term that I use with caution. The other one, the global land rush, again makes sense in many, many ways that there's all these movements of investment towards land for resource development, for food security, going around the world. But then again, if we look at, back to this map, and, and certainly for the diagrams for Cambodia and Laos, the, regional, the, the movements of investment are still staying quite regional. So we have to be careful by what we mean by global here. Are we talking about a whole, complete global market? Um, or are we talking about certain regional movements? A again, we need to be critical in how we use these terminologies so we don't get, we can work with the fashion, but we can also try and understand, it's our job to understand better what's really going on. So I'd like to, I just wanted to introduce that, the kind of, these are the kind of frame, fashion frames we've been talking about land in, in a big context. Now, a, a comment of, that came my way um, in terms of regionalization is like, this is all very important, but you know, you're going off to field work cases, you're going to the ground. So it's important also to, to look at, this is all fine, but how is it playing out? How is it playing out for local communities? Um, in the case of land, I've put up here a couple of uh, articles that came out, in, I think, in the last two weeks. The one on the left was in the Bangkok Post, and was a, is a story about um, there's a court, a, a court case, an investigation going on that in Saraburi province, which is just above Bangkok, um, some land was given over to a cement company to set up a processing factory. They could also use um, they. Uh, and they also were giving mining permits so they could mine rock in that area as well as part of part of a cement process. Now, it's now turning out that the local officials, um, probably the land titles that were then leased out to this company were forged, and this is actually forest land. This is a common, a common story of forest land being encroached upon. This is a common narrative in Thailand. The story on the right concerns, uh, is a, I think it, this is actually from the Norwegian, I can't see, it's too small on my screen, Norwegian uh, Refugee Council. Um, but it's, it, it, it refers to a report that's just come out by Human Rights Watch. And it's um, about the issue that of right of return for displaced people in Myanmar. And there's a big concern about as peace processes evolve in Myanmar, that there may, and maybe as economic development can maybe flourish, there will be perhaps more opportunities and openings for people who were forced out through conflict to return to their homes. But the problem is they will, may well find that the, their land has been taken. Now this could be for a government project, could be by the military, could by, be by local elites. There are many contexts. So this, um, this report is, is kind of pointing people towards like, how are we going to secure, as it says, secure the land rights or offer protection for people returning who probably don't even have the certificates on paper to prove that this was their land. It's a very complex and problematic situation that will be a further step in the hopeful development of Myanmar. I just want to introduce these two stories. We're going to come back to them in a, a bit later. The point I would like to make is that these are not isolated. Every week I'm looking through the papers and relating directly to land, there's stories, case examples, things like this in all the press around the region. 
And so what I want to stress is that as I talk about land um, in, in an academic context here, this is actually something that's playing out directly in the consciousness of uh, and affecting people in their everyday lives and being reported constantly. So it's, it's not some sort of esoteric, abstracted idea. It's something that is people are in concrete ways are aware of and, and um, their access or use of land is being um, affected constantly. I won't say more on that now because we'll see how that plays subsequently. Um, that's my kind of setup. So what I would, with that base, I would now like to kind of um, explain to you what this project is and what we're trying to do. So this is the Mekong Land Research Forum. Now, with all of this diff uh, different work, all these different issues, this work going on in land around the region, there was a point where um, development agencies from Switzerland, Germany, and Luxembourg decided that they really wanted to fund and get together a big project to try better to understand these dynamics around the region within countries, bring together this information from below, strengthen that voice from below, find ways to engage at the policy level and, and see how there might be a way to affect um, policy mandates regarding land in the future. Now, admittedly, there's a specialized focus within there, which is they're more interested in smallholder farmer rights. Family, farm, households who may have a lack of security to be able to keep hold of and use their land. So this is the context. And as part of, the, so you can imagine, this is a big, big project, a multi-million euro project, which has just finished its first five-year cycle and is about to go into its second four-year cycle. And as part of the work, they decided they need to understand better the research that's being done into land, try and group kind of pull together the voices of researchers better, which for me is partially academia, but also is in other, other fields. It's not just about, researcher is not just an academic, just as academics don't just work in academia, but will work on many projects um, with government agencies or with NGOs. But trying to take this research voice and feed it into these policy dialogues, into improving knowledge bases for local uses. So that's the rough aims of the pro project. And, and that side of things they set up as the Mekong Land Research Forum. So the project was, the forum was, as you can see, you've got the MRLG, which is the big project for, with Swiss and German and Luxembourg money, the Mekong Region Land Governance Project. As a, and then the research forum was developed in the University of Sydney and then handed over to RCSD at Chiang Mai University uh, in 2015. Um, it was decided that RCSD was an appropriate hub within the region to hold it, being within the region, but also having a legacy of interest in land. Most notably that um, the center itself, if, if I, I hope I explain right on behalf of Ajahn Chayan, but the center itself was set up partially around the, an interest in forestry rights in the 1980s and 90s. And, and as, as kind of forest areas were being developed in Thailand, also to protect, protect the rights of people living and working within those forest areas. Then land kind of went quiet for a while in Thailand, but now it's, it's come, back as a, come back up as a, as a central core topic. And so, and so it was decided that this would be a good space to have the project. Now, okay, in order to show you what's going on, I think, no more music, no more music. Yes, so, the co there's, there's three elements of the project very quickly. There's um, this online resource, which I'll explain to you. 
there's a research network trying to bring together and collect these researcher, researcher knowledge and voices. And we have, I think, about 130 researchers on a Google group. And then there's a kind of educational outreach focusing on training, master's training, and um, seminars, and, 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 and curriculum sharing and development around the region. Now, for those of you whose work is Obviously, everyone here, their work is, has an interest in the region. And for some of you, your work will engage directly with natural resource governance, with land governance. So I'm hoping by showing this that this could be a resource that's useful for you. And it's uh, www.mekonglandforum.org. Please take a note now. So I'm going to quickly go through the website. The home page uh, gives you a basic introduction, and we always have some. Do we see? Oh, we do see some news. If, for example, actually the the case I showed you from Myanmar is up here, the right of seas land, Myanmar. Um, as a use, if people are interested in land and want to find an overview, a useful starting point is these reports here. Five reports have been made, kind of giving the overview of the political economy of land. Um, this is the overview in the Mekong region. Um, these were con put together under the guidance of Professor Philip Hirsch from University of Sydney. And I think they're very good starting points to kind of start to try and understand the issues. So I reckon, and, and they are directly accessible from this page. Also, if you're interested in joining the research network, you can just click here and you have an application form. So. That's my propaganda out the way. Um, there is a tab here which takes you through what kind of what I'm describing now. And there's also a tab which shows you how to use the site, which is what I'm doing now. So in one sense, we have a basic repository or database here. We have a collect, um, we are feeding in peer reviewed work research on land. So this is not meant to be exhaustive of all research, but the pieces of research here have been selected for their quality, what they add to the kind of the, add to the collection of, on land. Um, so if we see the, the latest one, there's 515 articles in here. So it's kind of building up to be a stand, substantial body of work, I would say. So for each article you can click and it will give you details um, of the kind of, um, the bibliographic details give you an abstract also it gives access where available unfortunately we don't we can't counter um, journal um, journal publishing rights although I think pretty much f at least for your university connections at the moment you will be able to access everything and if not contact me Yes. So, and there are many ways to kind of sort through this work. At the moment, it's put in terms of date, uh, in terms of date, but you can also arrange in terms of author, the title, type. Now, um, the type refers to whether an article has been annotated or not. For example, here, oh, oh, actually, the top article is partially from Carl, Carl Middleton, who spoke earlier this week. Um, for what we see as key articles, as well as the basic bibliographic details, we also offer a kind of a bit more detail on the articles. So of its overall relevance towards land, its relevance to key themes, which I'm going to come to in a moment, and also the way the research has been conducted, the, the methodology and the form. So hopefully this kind of gives you a further way in so if, if you wish to consult key texts that have been annotated. Um, you, you can uh, actually search at a greater level. Actually, let me go back to year here. And then you can search at a greater depth. So you can search in terms of author, if you want a certain author, whether it's annotated, which country, which year, and the key themes. 
I'll show you how that works in a moment, but I think this is the most important thing that the site offers in, for you and m hopefully makes it something more than just a database in that what we've tried to do is provide a sort of conceptual framework for people to think about, analyze, and access work on land. And that is by placing all research within the context of 12 key themes. I'm not going to go through all of them, but for if, if I go top left, um, land policy and land law, does the article really dive into the legal aspects, the implementation of government policy on land. Now, for each key theme, you can click on it, and then it will give you, a, as with the, um, these annotations, gives you a quick overview, um, key reform issues, current critique and debate. But if you wish to go deeper, just looking at that theme, there is an extended synopsis attached, which is like a, a six-page kind of article looking through the research text, discussing in greater detail that particular theme. So this is a, a six page overview, um, more detailed overview looking at land policy and land and how it's addressed uh, in research on land. Yeah. So not every extended synopsis, um, every key theme has this extended synopsis, but most do. Um, I think some of them relate directly to some of the interests for this summer score. Um, migration has been a core interest here, if I understand correctly. So we have agrarian change and land and its relation to uh, labor and migration. Um, environment, land and the environment, pollution, deforestation, climate change, conser conservation zoning. Um, in terms of looking at these regional investment, movements, we can think in terms of FDI and land access, concessions, contract farming. What are these doing to farmers at the local level? So you have all of these different entry points that may tie in with your own study that could be a useful way to then you, uh, access work on land. So if I go back to search and download, what I could do is say, okay, um, I would like to look at Myanmar, and let's look at, since we were looking at mi migration is one of the topics here, so we can look at migration and labor in Myanmar, and here we have, okay, there's five results here, which is something, but we now have a source point um, for within which we've looked, basically, I've, we've looked through each article and we've kind of identified core themes. So within these articles, there will be information looking, focusing on migration, which could be labor migration or could be, in the case of Myanmar, often forced migration out of conflict. So hopefully what I can, I can demonstrate by this is that this is not just a database, but this is potentially also a tool for you to, to be able to analyze work with land connected to your own topics if it's not direct. That's what I'm hoping. Um, I'd like to go back as an example. I'd like to go back to a PowerPoint and the two stories we saw earlier on the cement plant in Saraburi, Thailand, and indigenous um, land rights for, dis for returning um, IDPs for internally displaced peoples in Myanmar. What I quickly did, so this is not so scientific, is I quickly had a look through the articles and tried to kind of checklist them next to these 12 key themes. And so, Maybe I won't go through them all, but certainly for the case of displacement in Myanmar, what you can see is that this story is cutting across so many different topics related to land. Um, certainly the call in the report um, is asking for how can we kind of legally protect these people 
and enshrine their land rights when they return. Also, you can look at it in terms of what did land policy, the land laws I spoke of earlier, how did they influence, act, govern actions or military actions within a state of conflict that drove people away from their land beforehand. Um, we can also talk in terms of, of course, land grabbing. It fits in quite clearly there. Um, a lot of this land grabbing has been connecting to getting foreign, aid, uh, getting foreign investment. This land suddenly turns into a concession. Um, migration, of course, is covered. A lot of these concessions are being used for cash cropping. So there's all these different kind of overlapping topics coming through just one single story. And this is the point where I would like to kind of finish off and make a connection to the notion of transdisciplinary studies. And um, I guess I'll go to this. Um, first of all, hopefully through this research and what we're trying to do and engaging with these stories, this is about real life problems and this is about real life problems that are happening all the time, that is plentiful. It's not a marginalized issue. This is a touching into core concerns of many people around the region. By seeing how many topics it, uh, overlapping here, we are deep, dealing with extremely complex scenarios. And I think this is, this, it, and it's this kind of basis, if I understand correctly, it's from this kind of real life complexity that transdisciplinary studies has emerged as an attempt to try A, to understand, B, to act on a certain level. Um, hopefully, by engaging, by showing you the, the different key issues, we can see how they do not belong in one single faculty of department. These are interdisciplinary issues. They're involving lawyers, people in the faculty of law, political scientists, social scientists, anthropologists, soil specialists, climate change specialists. Many, all these different experts are needed to bring their understanding to the table. And I, if I understand correctly, it's, it's the challenge is then to see how do we take these different knowledge bases together and kind of assimilate this knowledge to gain that deep level of understanding and perhaps then move on to the next point, engage with multiple different stakeholders involved in these issues. Now, the th I think one of the hard, may maybe this comes from my perspective, but one of the hardest things is placing this within a realm of very unequal power relations. So it's fine identifying and bringing stakeholders together, but particularly in this, maybe in this region, you could argue anywhere, the relations to be able to talk together are extremely unequal. And so one of the biggest challenges is finding the space, say, to promote, from, from the argument of MRLG, to promote the role the voice, the rights of the smallholder farmer to the policy maker who's thinking of national economic development. And also the, the way these people are put in next to each other is an extremely hierarchical positioning and makes it very hard to kind of try and negotiate complex problems and conflicts that could be, could be satisfactory to all parties. Um, I guess that turned into quite a short talk. Maybe you don't mind. We could do some more ballet. Um, but I'm going to kind of leave it there as a sort of entry point. Hopefully it's kind of touched onto transdisciplinariness a little bit. And then I'll be happy to take any questions or comments or we could discuss further that connection to transdisciplinary if you wish. Thank you. So if you have anything to say or question, please raise your hand. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, 
uh, as a, if I understand you right, uh, the beginning from uh, this project was initiated by um, development agencies and development organizations. Is that right? Initially, kind of the, the call for the whole project to be set up was by SDC and GIZ together with, um, um, what's the luck, luck, um, Aluax, is it? I think Luxembourg. But pr principally, um, the, the Swiss Development Co Cooperation and GIZ, the, that's the German International Development Agency. So uh, the incentive to do it actually came, came for them. We want to invest in improved land rights and Im improved land rights for smallholders in the region. And they put a, co I think, if I understand correct, they put a call out for people to apply and set up a project to utilize the funding they were putting forward. Does that answer your question? Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I'm, I'm just always a little bit critical, which, which um, kind of development and what, what, uh, what is the underlying understanding of development from, from this project? Because uh, there is this debate that um, development organizations that may be, um, I don't know how to say it, um, this critic that maybe, uh, let's say, the Western world or the glo global north isn't that interested um, in really changing structures and problems in so-called the global south. So um, I, I just wanted to ask if, if the, the term development is questioned or it, if it's, um, if it's, um, if a local knowledge is, is used in terms of mm. development or if it's just this Western economic development thinking, which is too. And maybe you can be a um, little bit more explicit about um, the methods that you use and um, what, what, how is the work with stakeholders shaped? What are you really doing with each other? And you mm. talked about um, knowledge that you want to bring, you bring knowledge together, I think from stakeholders and ac academics and so on. And you said something like assimilate knowledge. Um, what do you mean with assimilate knowledge? If you remember. Okay, if I understand right, there's probably about four questions in there. I to you're, you're, the, the question you are trying to formulate, I, I totally understand and it's, yeah, in fact, I can add to that and I, can, I think I can give you a good example to demonstrate the concern because I think a, you have a lot of development work, that, that sort of high-end development work which is still conforming to kind of certain ec kind of multilateral economic systems and you could argue that actually their practice at local levels won't help regardless. I can frame that for you with an example of land. Um, the thing that gives me hope with this project is that, and I don't know, and in that sense, I don't know how much of it came from the original development, national development corporations, or the implementers, and the implementers are the French NGO GRET and um, the Australian uh, organization Land Equity International. They're the two main implementers. But the fact, the focus, the fact that the focal point for the project has been on smallholder farmers and their rights. So it's rather than trying to think in terms of fixing them into an economic system, it's trying to keep the point of emphasis on their rights, their lively, considering their livelihood development at the community level. So as, as sort of a, a, as an ideological level, I'm hopeful that the, at the very least the intention is good. Now, the danger is, and this is where I bring an example for you, if you think purely in terms of the formalization of land rights, there could be negative knock-on effects. If you think purely in terms of, let's make a proper system, a proper land administration, let's give everyone a piece of paper saying, this is my land, this, this, and this is protected. You could, there's a big argument to say, one, this protects your land. Two, 
this will help your development because you can use that piece of paper and you can go to the bank and access credit and you can use your land as collateral. So there's the argument there that land can be used for development at the local level. The flip side of that is that you're bringing everyone into a marketized land system. And actually that can work quite in quite unequal ways and be detrimental to local farmer. You can have lots of people will easily give up their land because they can sell it easy and for a terrible deal. That's one example. Um, with this project, the other side of that, this project is that there's a lot of effort to try and recognize customary tenure. Is that you don't necessarily have to give security for a land user doesn't just have to be a privatized piece of paper. You can also have some sort of document that even at a customary level that could give a certain amount of protection. So I think even for organizations like the FAO, they're starting to talk in terms of sufficient security rather than total security. And that's maybe you're, you're going to sort of quite a gray area with that, but it's trying to look beyond pure formalization. Um, so I think there's a lot of effort with the project as an alternative to this e Western formalization of land to also think in terms of actually more traditional systems. How can we utilize them and use that to give protection? The problem often there is that state level in countries around the region, their interest is not so much they want formalization. They, if formalization brings you into a, a national land market and is much more usable, it, it, it brings periphery groups into national systems and that can be much more useful for a state organization. So this customary side of things, it's a tricky one, but it is tried to be addressed. Concerning your other questions, I'm just trying to remember what they are. Could you, do you remember any of the other? <laughs> I was asking for the exact ways in which you are working mm. with uh, stakeholders and for example, local people. Mm. Right. And, um, exactly. and you said like, assimilate uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what you right. mean with that. I think the assimilate knowledge was actually a reference towards transdisciplinary studies. It's only from my experience and understanding is, is that the idea that if you, if you can take different, it's the idea of taking different knowledge bases and actually creating new knowledge out of it, which is something I'm still, it's, it's something I'm still trying. Synthesize. Synthesize, but it can also create something new. Um, I'm not a transdisciplinary expert here. We, we could maybe ask, we could put that question out in a, in a moment, in a wider context. Um, in terms of what are we actually doing, I mean, a lot of the work in the past five years has been engaging lots of different people, and it's been quite scattershot for the first round, and necessarily so, to try and act as an umbrella to pe bring people in. But say for an example, a concrete example of an event, um, I was helping out with um, a consultation on customary tenure that took place in Napido in Myanmar uh, about a year and a half ago. And this was bringing together NGO groups and um, government officials from around the region to Napido and, and somehow within these different, having a two day workshop, we would be reflecting upon the sit kind of giving a, a status, uh, a reflection on the, st the state of knowledge for customary tenure in each country, debating the implications, looking at how they relate. We had guests from India and the Philippines to talk about systems that they set up there, the notion, for example, of an ancestral domains in the Philippines, um, community-led customary um, movements in India and and in a way it's it's not something we you could say would have a direct output or it kind of had 
rec yeah, kind of guide guidelines and, and and guide books coming out of it, but it's kind of setting a platform for it's his long term engagement to try and work between these groups and maybe see if some of this these discussions can get fed into the kind of the closed door policy discussions. I mean, there's lots of debates you get there. It's like other people we're inviting. Will they actually? Could they actually affect anything? Yes or no? There's lots of critique you could do, but you could also argue you end up doing nothing if you're not careful. And in the next phase, we're actually focusing much more on two work streams being customary tenure and responsible agricultural investment. And the idea will be t these are being developed at the moment, but to have much more targeted work plan to engage with these uh, uh, government officials further, can we can we set in play any anything towards policy influence? Any further? Thank you very much for the good questions. Any further comments or questions? Ajahn. I came in late, but maybe I missed this. But throughout all of your uh, literature review and things like that, um, you did you run into cases almost like uh, have no significant, but it is really a core of the problem that you're addressing. For an example, <clears throat> in the Northeast, um, one lady, she's the one who first stood up against the government who came with machine to, uh, uh, get, uh, to do something with her land. And she's the one who made history by claiming that this is my ancestor land. You know, you say uh, you, the, the government has rights and deeds and everything, but you dare. I'm here with my machete, and you dare to invade my land. And then, you know, something happened after that. It's a tiny thing, uh, because it's dealing with dams, with uh, so on and so forth. And more recently, I listened to a presentation by Nam Tun Tu. In Another lady, she's spirit medium. They wanted to take her land away to relocate her. And she said, no, I live here. The spirit that I possess or possess me tell me to live here. And then again, the big government, the World Bank yield. And uh, more recently, there's another case in Cambodia. The whole spirit medium uh, ritual to guard against the taking land over. So this kind of thing is uh, dealing with land, with women, and with spiritual, or with actually, I, I think that's a, a really core of a culture, a local culture. So you ha have you run into all this, and then you take notes on that at all, whether it, this kind of thing uh, uh, is, um, I mean, has room in, your, in part of your work. Thank you. It's it's an it's an interesting one. It's it's a very interesting field because there's that maybe partial conflict, say from an anthropological perspective of having of of gaining in depth ethnographical understanding of a place, which is often necessary in terms of land to understand. The, um, the complexity of land arrangements there. But then, within the context of a project where you kind of, you have target aims, you have, uh, you're looking kind of for, um, you are looking for, a, I mean, it's, it's a form of action research in that sense. You, you're looking for certain output and certain influence. So how can you engage these kind of more in-depth 
studies. I mean, as an example, if, if she doesn't mind me using it, just to show how complex things can be, um, Sukhmida, thank you. I can use your example. Thank you so much. Yesterday we were talking about uh, a research case from one of our students here, Sugnida from Laos, who in a village she's, among village she's looking at, has mixed titling. As a household, maybe you have four pieces of land for different uses. Some of your land is, for your, is your house, some of your land is your farmland, and there may be other, some of it may be like fixed crops, shifting cultivation with rice, could be different uses. Now in this village, it, as far as I understand, that the land for houses has official government certificate. The rest of your land is ordered under customary tenure. So within these different, co if, if there are conflicts or different land, suddenly when you see this context of different land uses, it's like, oh, wait a sec, what if that happens? Who am I appealing to? How does this all fit together? And this is where, when you, and uh, when you go to the field, things are often messy. We're going back to the uh, notion of complexity. Real life is messy. So how do we deal with that? And, and in that sense, I guess I'm coming across, I'm noting that these in-depth ethnographical understandings are necessary, yet how can you then make that presentable for a government person? You can't give them, you can't give them in a three-day workshop. So th these are kind of challenges of making those connections between kind of the messiness of reality and the kind of the the box of legal development policy. Um, I'd like to add up on this question and, and, and your answer that, like, especially when it comes to customary law and all those things, it becomes quite messy and also problematic um, how to really uh, communicate this to the, upper, to the upper levels why that is an important stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it becomes even more messy when you think about that, um, at least to my experience from, for example, Nam Turn 2, where I also did some, some research in the villages, that customary law and customary like tenure and all this, stuff, or like those ideas about customary law aren't necessarily just like the, the positive baseline or something. They can be, can be very problematic in themselves, mm -hmm. um, in the sense, for example, that um, at least in the case that I had um, a woman was basically killed in a village because she was accused to be a certain kind of spirit. So uh, there is a lot of like witch hunt stuff going on as well. And this is not all, this is not all like just because you deal with customary law this, or, or customary tenure, this is not just a positive thing. So mm -hmm. this is like part of the messiness that I wanted to add up to. I think gender is a very good example when you look at customary law. In certain cases, in, in land, customary law can be great. It's working off a matrilineal system. It's, it's part of a protection against a, a patriarchy. But in other cases, um, when a national law is, at least in theory, demanding equal, equality in property, in rights, that actually so customary law may be fully patriarchal. And so, yes, it can, I think gender is a very good example to see how it's not necessarily one way or the other. Yeah, I would also like to return to your question and, and your answer, because I th think there was a more general problem implicated, because I would assume that you still stick in your argument to the uh, assumption that going deep into some problems to have the whole picture to, to get deeply into, into description and understanding, that's the worst in itself. As an anthropologist and non-TDR research, I would say, okay. But I think if we are in a TDR research, the strength of anthropology is that we are dealing with people and doing experience near methods. But the 
uh, what is the opposite of strength? The weakness of anthropology is that we all want to, de to go into all these factors and their interrelations. And if I would have given uh, an answer for, as you did, I would have said, let's look from the problem-oriented view and see in which parts we need detailed knowledge, we, which we can't know before, and, and then look for deep knowledge, whereas in other areas, we probably don't need that. So a deep, a deep understanding, a deep knowledge, uh, de I mean detailed and contextualized knowledge, is not a worse in itself in TDR or TDS. Um, the reason I raise, <clears throat> because uh, these specific cases, it's only almost not even a footnote, but a mentioning in all the big reports of them and of uh, like, uh, like the second uh, more recent that in Namtun 2. That's a report by the World Bank uh, manager of relocation and monitoring effort from the beginning up until the end. So, uh, and then uh, the first case, that's in the Northeast, that almost some 30 years ago. But then again, I think, uh, I, think uh, I forgot exactly how uh, the government uh, yield on, on her case. But she made it famous, and then I think more recognition of how women, how a woman like her you know, an uneducated one and live peacefully all her life. But suddenly, you know, uh, land was taken from her and then she came up with that idea herself. You know, and that make headlines, making more awareness uh, by the big uh, powerful uh, organization like the government and World Bank and ADB Bank to at least, you know, be thorough, not to overlook but again, that didn't shed any light on the Nam Tung Tu in Laos and more recently on the dam uh, um, in uh, Cambodia. So it's repeating again. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, you know, uh, how we can capitalize on that, not even a footnote, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, a new challenging methodology that uh, this workshop tried to pursue you know, in order to including that kind of thing, to add on or to whatever, you know, to make to uh, at least uh, to, to move forward, you know, going beyond that was uh, overlooked. And a case that I really uh, like is uh, uh, the, the issue of inequality, you know, specifically to a, a woman from Vietnam, how she decide to marry non-Vietnamese and then, you know, and still see that it's not inequality because it is my decision. And that, I think, need to be deeper, you know, in, in to recognize in whatever the new methodology that you're going to be pursuing because it's a repeating over and over, you know, up until now and through my, you know, 40-some years working in the rural area in this area. Thank you. I think what is reassuring from that case is that it seems like a voice from below did get heard. So maybe we could learn from that and see what were the conditions whereby it could. And these are the kind of, you know, this is, I think, uh, go, I'll go back to Carl Middleton. I think he's doing very good work to try and identify how that can be done. I think we're pretty much out of time. Is there any final comment or question before? before the next thing happens. In that case, thank you for all staying awake. Don't forget, whenever you're typing, feel the shoulder blades connected with your stomach, and you'll have a long and happy life. <laughs>